but i think the way to think about this is we've just started building these really tiny compute nodes that are quantum compute nodes so they can come in through a tooling and then they can penetrate your system and compromise everything who's problem is that yeah. now if you think about the landscape there are like hundreds and hundreds of models out there and they're becoming bigger by the day hey everyone it's david bumble coming to you from cisco live here with a very special guest vijoy welcome let me give you that thank you david it's a pleasure to be here yeah, it's fantastic we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics so ai ai and networking ai and security perhaps but when I was preparing for this, I was told that you work for a really interesting group within Cisco, and it's recently been rebranded. So you've got to tell me about this Emerging Technologies group, right? That's right. The group was called Emerging Technologies and Incubation. Yeah. As you can imagine, saying that is a mouthful. Yeah, exactly. So we used to shorten it to ET, ET&I. and I was like, what the hell is ET&I? <laughs> so you have to say the whole name again. Yes, exactly. Right? So we just rebranded to Outshift. Oh, that's the jacket right. here, right here. And the whole analogy here is, think of a really, really fast car. Yep. You're part of the car, you're outshifting technology, competition, and you're bringing innovation full speed ahead. I love that. So correct me if I'm wrong, is this kind of like Cisco VC type thing where you're investing in like stuff that's new technology emerging or is it something no, different? No, this is actually completely different. So think of it as an internal incubator. Oh, brilliant, yeah. So we actually, if you think about Cisco, innovation happens everywhere. Yep. So innovation is happen happening in Collab, in yep. networking, security, observability. Yep. The reason for outshift was to build new businesses, to get into new markets, to talk to new user and buyer personas that are not familiar to Cisco, and maybe Cisco is not familiar to them. So the idea is, yes, there is tech, there's emerging tech, but the stress was an incubation, which is like, can we get a new business across, a bunch of new businesses across, that takes Cisco into newer spaces. So it's, uh, it's from the ground up, we are completely end-to-end. -end. So we've got product engineering, we've got SDRs, biz dev, marketing, oh, wow. yep. customer success, all of it is self-contained. So almost like a startup. I love that. But we are Cisco employees. So one of the things you're working on is AI, right? That's right. So uh, AI is, is all over the news, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly about it. But how is AI, or what is AI being used for within Cisco? Can you, like, what's the vision? What products perhaps are being, uh, are using AI? So can you tell us about AI, like, within Cisco and, like, sort of where it's going? And then we could talk about some responsible AI stuff maybe a bit later. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you think about AI, it's been there for a while. Yeah. Right? I mean, we've got export systems that exist in God knows when. And what typically, the way we think about AI is, and I think the, 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 the industry is thinking about it as well, is you've got predictive AI, yep. which is like you look at data, you have models that actually can predict and provide recommendations. Yep. And then now you have generative AI, yep. which you look at data, you have models that can actually generate content. Yep. And generative AI came into the scene 2017, I would say, when we had a seminal paper from Google. Yep. Yep. And there was a birth of the transformer, not the movie, but the yep. actual yeah, exactly. uh, yep. model. And BERT came around, GPT came around, now, if you think about the landscape, there are like hundreds and hundreds of models out there. Yeah. And they're becoming bigger by the day, which is, again, another topic of discussion. So now you have predictive and generative. And whereas predictive was actually used pervasively in our products in the past. So if you think about networking and baseline and statistical inferencing, and if you think about observability and how do you ensure that things are normal right in your environment, in your infrastructure, uh, it was it was everywhere. It was CX, observability, networking, security. With generative AI, the use cases are going beyond in-product use okay. into every aspect of business that Cisco or any other enterprise, and for that matter, does. So we are breaking it down into general purpose use, yep. which is chat GPT, tell me what is Gen AI. Yep. Versus in-product use, which is can we do computer vision? Can we do summarization? Can we do uh, action items and so on and so forth? And then we are looking at in business, like run the business use cases. Like there are already tools just like Jasper to do marketing or there are tools like GitHub Copilot to yeah. create yeah. code. So yeah. there are run the business tools, the in product tools, and there are general purpose tools. And so we're breaking it down into those three categories. And we are looking at it pervasively and saying, it's across the board, can we now do it in a responsible manner? Now, 
responsible AI, I know we, we're going to touch upon that in a bit, but even responsible AI was there for a while. I mean, we're looking at predictive uh, AI and we wanted to do it responsibly. But since the space itself has become so wide now, yeah. and it's being used everywhere, even the space for responsible AI has blossomed quite a bit. So long story short, we have a ton of predictive AI capabilities in everything that we have announced, uh, whether it's observability, whether it's in the networking space, like predictive internet, uh, whether it's in collaboration, we, they use it all the time. Some of the gen AI capabilities are just making their way through into the product stream. So we are looking at text summarization for meetings, okay. for example. So, so can like within we, WebEx, right? For WebEx. We are looking at text summarization when we look at security. Yeah. So you look at a bunch of these CVEs and there are hundreds and hundreds of yeah, CVEs. Yeah, I was going to ask you about security because that's a big one, right? That's a big one. Yeah. And I think if you look at that and it's just overkill. I mean, yeah. if you look at a SecOps person, they're drowning. Yeah, the, the CVEs and stuff, yeah. So how do you surface things, yeah. prioritize them, provide better context? And Gen AI is an awesome tool for that. So it's making its way through, but it's not there yet. That's great news. Yeah. So, I mean, the uh, chat GPT and BART get all the, like, the headlines, but it's really good to hear that Cisco... I've been working on this for a long time. So if you think about ChatGPT and BARD, they are the latest incarnation, like Palm 2 is the latest yeah. incarnation of large language models. But as we discussed, I mean, transformers have existed for yeah. a while now. Yeah. And we've been using versions of, let's say, BARD. So there's a Robota, yeah. which is a BARD instance that actually is used in products today, in, in collaboration today. The versions of that that are being used in an embedded manner in Meraki cameras, for example, to do computer vision yeah. stuff. So, so there's, there's a ton of stuff being used already but the space is constantly evolving. And one of the things that we are realizing is there'll be a gamut of use cases like we discussed, like general purpose, run the business in product. And along with that, you'll have the gamut of models that exist in your environment. Yeah. So as an enterprise like Cisco or any other enterprise out there, yes, there'll be people who'll be going out there trying to plan the birthday party or the next travel destination. They will use open AI. But then there are other people who are like thinking about how to use this in a product like we discussed. And you can use a large language model as is. Let's say you're using, using an Azure hosted version of, of GPT-4 or you're using Palm 2. Or you can use a private tenant version of this. So let's say you can use an Anthropic or a Cohere or even an Azure hosted version on a private tenant. Or you can use the plethora of open source that's coming out, which is actually getting to the point where it's 80 to 90% accuracy of a large language model, especially for specific use cases. So you can start there for foundation models, but what we're seeing in the world is for specific use cases, we talked about security, yep. talk about networking, observability, for all of these specific use cases, the distillation of those foundation models into custom models is actually where the game is going to be. So you take that foundation model, you feed it through custom data, you fine tune it, yep. then you run it in and as a service offering, like a SaaS offering, or you run it in an embedded offering, and the accuracies for those kinds of use cases with those custom models is through the roof. And that, I think, is where the game is going to be played, where you get an end-to-end -end stack that includes custom models derived from a foundation model with machines prompting for what's needed and not humans. Because, I mean, the concern is, I see two concerns. Number one, this is another thing that I have to learn. So I have to learn, if I'm a network engineer, networking, security, uh, automation, now I've got to learn AI. It's too much. And then the other thing is, okay, AI is going to take all our jobs away. So let me answer the first one yep. first, because I think, uh, so my kid, yep. uh, he's like now doing homework using ChatGPT, like every other kid out <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, get, you get a problem and you feed the prompt yep. and out spits an answer. And at least I tell him, take a look at the answer and at least make sure it's correct <laughs> exactly. before you submit yeah, exactly. it. So, the AI is hallucinating, yeah? Yeah, and I think, so, 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 so the kid comes back to me and says, why do I need to learn literature or history? Exactly. Or, or even yeah. coding, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've got chat GPT. And there are a couple of things. First of all, any AI model today is a tool. Yeah. Just like Google or coding, just yeah. like writing. Yeah. So it's a tool. It'll make a few things easier and obsolete. It'll make a few things better, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think if you treat of it, think of it that way, that's, that's the perfect way to, to start. The other thing to think about it is it should help you in your work. Yeah. Right? It should not be a threat to you. Yeah. 
And it's a starting point. So some of us are calling it automated inspiration. So the yeah. starting point is inspiration. Finally, the way to think about this is it's only as good as what you feed into it. So when you think about specificity, when you think about recency, those are things which are very, very hard for a general purpose large language model yeah. to deal with. Yeah. So that's where humans come in. And if you think about it, like this world has existed. Let's take coding. Yeah, exactly. You can go to Stack Overflow today and, and just copy, yeah. just copy and paste. Yeah. This is just making it easier. Yeah. But what you copy and paste, honestly, should be automated anyway. So if you want to try and add value, that's where your value comes in. Yeah. So the level of abstraction in my mind is just going higher and higher. So we're using better parts of our cognitive brain and automating things away that are should be mundane. So let's get to responsible because the flip side is, you know, AI, AI is going to eat us alive. Is um, what you, what's Cisco's position on responsible AI, and you know, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, so I think that's a big topic, and I think what's happened is, like I was mentioning earlier, with predictive AI, there was a notion of responsible AI that existed for a while now, and we've been a big proponent of responsible AI and human rights and privacy from a long, long time ago, uh, 2012, in fact, I think. And as the field has evolved from just data usage yeah. to AI uh, being everywhere yeah. to now generative AI coming in, like we discussed, you're moving from predictive and recommendations to content that is, that's being generated. Yeah, so, exactly. So the attributes of responsible AI, in my mind, have just expanded. So we looked at bias. We used to look at bias. We used to look at uh, personal data. Yeah. yeah. But now we are looking at false content. We are looking at unanticipated content. We are looking at IP infringement because content is now being generated. So the attributes for us for responsible AI have just expanded. And again, if you think about the space of all kinds of models in your enterprise, the process and people way of handling responsible AI, to me, need to transition towards a more quantifiable, verifiable, software-oriented, automated way of dealing with responsible AI. And that's what Cisco is looking at. So it's a big deal for us. Our customer data and privacy is extremely important to us and has been for a while now. But with generative AI, things are even more complicated. And I don't think just throwing people and process at the problem will work anymore. So we need to actually, as an industry, work at software and automation and tools to solve this problem in a holistic end-to-end -end manner in a very quantifiable way so that you can go out and say, this model, this data set, this use case compared to this other model data set and use case, which is more biased versus the other. Yeah. I think that's where we are headed towards uh, for responsible AI. What you will see us moving towards is also some of these problems that we just talked about in the responsible AI space. Yeah. It does not end in the space of responsible AI. And every customer that we talk to, they're like, we're in the same boat as you guys, which is we need to do, deal with AI in a responsible way, but there are issues around how do we do request routing, so prompt routing, which model do we send a prompt to? The landscape that we talked about earlier, you can send a prompt to a public uh, LLM, foundation model, you can send it to a private hosted LLM. You can send it to a custom in-house LLM. So it's like, where do you send a prompt? Yeah. It depends on the use case. How do you manage cost? So if there is a question that has been asked before, do you want to go there and ask a question again? Because that's a ton of cost. Yeah. Secondly, if you send it to an LLM, you know this, the same prompt five times over will give you five responses. So can we get consistency in response? Can we look at model poisoning? Can we look at, uh, again, ethical and fairness, ethics and fairness? Can we look at data security? And what can we do there? So there's a whole slew of use cases that every enterprise is facing in this landscape. And we want to get there and solve some of those problems. Uh, that's, that's at least where we're headed. That's fantastic. I mean, emerging technologies is the group that you, well, the rebranded. I love the name for me personally when I saw emerging technologies like what, what's happening in the next like few years. So quantum computing perhaps is, is something else buzzword that you hear a lot. Well, what are you seeing that 
AI is obviously rage of the day today, but any other exciting stuff that you can share? Yeah, so there's, there's an entire spectrum of things that we're working at. Right? Yeah. So if you think about the here and now, uh, the here and now is if you think about modern applications and the way you and I develop applications, I don't develop applications anymore, <laughs> unfortunately, but the way everyone does is you basically pick software assets. It's like, it's like a kid in a candy store. Yep, yep. So you take candy of the blue kind, the hard candy of this kind, and then maybe you have chocolates of that kind, and you take pick and choose candy, you put it in a bag, and that's your modern application. So in the, in the application sense, it's like software assets that I might develop internally as an organization, software assets that are provided by a cloud provider like an yeah. AWS or Google. Uh, there are software assets that I consume through APIs because there are SaaS providers like yeah. Salesforce or Workday and so on and so forth. And then there are these edge assets, mobile APIs, all of these assets that we bring together to build your modern application. Yeah. In this kind of environment, you have the problem of discoverability, lifecycle management, connectivity because there's data flow happening, and security. It's like a highly distributed environment. If stuff goes wrong, whose problem is that? Yeah. Yeah. Is the developer's problem, is the organization's problem. They're not going to go back to a cloud provider or the SaaS provider and say, there's a problem there. You have to debug it, figure out what's wrong, and then go to the provider, maybe. So I think so. the first thing that we're doing is we're solving the security, discoverability, and connectivity problem for distributed modern applications. And you're going to see. So this has just been announced. Can you give us some details? Panoptica, I believe? Yes. Panoptica is uh, basically our cloud native application security platform. As you can imagine, there are a whole slew of new things yep. that we are announcing. So first and foremost, it's in the modern application space. So it is trying to solve that problem that we just talked about, which is if you are building an application that has a ton of open source, like 70% of all applications today, package.sas yep. is open source. Yep. So you have a ton of open source, you have public cloud assets, you have assets that you're accessing through an API from a SaaS provider, how do you ensure security exactly. of that modern application? And if you can imagine the, the, the vast surface area of this thing, yeah. it's, it's incomprehensible. Yeah, log for, log for shell, right? I mean, it's incomprehensible, right? So it's, it's humanly incomprehensible. So how do you bring context yeah. and prioritization to that space? So that's what Panoptica does, which is it provides a visualization of an attack path. Because an attacker can come in, the an attacker is after your compute resources, denial of service, yep. or data. Yep. One of those three things. They can come in through any of these assets. Yep. They don't care. So they can come in through something that is vulnerable, an API maybe, or tooling. Yep. Like the solar winds was actually a exactly. build system. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So they can come in through a tooling, and then they can penetrate your system and compromise everything. So we provide attack paths, so it's easy, easy to visualize. You get context, and then we prioritize those attack paths. So you can go in and solve the five things that matter to you. So that's what we are announcing, and then uh, we've announced, in fact. And the other thing is, as an incubation engine, like OutShift, is not just about the tech. Yep. It's about the go-to market as well. So these, this, this, uh, this offering, actually speaks to the SecOps, but it speaks to SREs, yep. it speaks to developers. And developers like to try out things. Developers like to play around yep. and then figure out if they like it, then they will swipe their own credit card and maybe then there will be an enterprise sale. Cisco has been an enterprise sales company. So we are actually experimenting with the entire bottom-up product-led growth motion as well. So what you see in the product is a freemium offer a pro tier where you can swipe your credit card. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we've released a ton of open source. No, no strings attached. You can try out things in the VM security space, in the API security space, in the container security space, without worrying about anything about product. And they will actually provide value to you. If you like it, you want to take it forward, you can look at Panoptica, but you don't have to. So it's a whole slew of new go-to-market motions as well as new technology that's been announced. Edge is becoming more and more important. Yeah, yeah. The way we define edge is as the first hop from a human to a machine. I like that, yeah, yeah. So it could be your mobile phone. Yeah. It could be a, an AR, VR headset. Yeah. 
but those are consumer oriented cisco doesn't play in that space but we are looking at manufacturing floors we are looking at retail stores we are looking at cars so all of these places where you still have a human to a machine but in a b2b context and if you think of it that way the edge is basically a data problem yeah yeah so data is being generated by the human by the environment insights are needed by the human by the environment so can you deal with data security compliance and distributed ai ml at that edge wow yeah so that's problem number 2 problem number 3 we talked about in the ai ml space looking at all kinds of attributes to solve for the space of generative ai and finally quantum which is a little bit further out and we're looking at we are a networking company we are a security company yeah it's worrying yeah we want to build the next generation of quantum internet and the next generation of quantum security and if you think about where we are with quantum we are 70 years in the past and we are 70 years in the future at the same time okay and that's a quantum statement right there a uh, superposition of of times but i think the way to think about this is we've just started building these really tiny compute nodes that are quantum compute nodes they're like 150 qubits 100 qubits this is what transistors used to be 70 years ago but we have the knowledge of 70 years of computing in front of us and so we can leverage that so if you think about what we are trying to do in the quantum space you're taking these small quantum nodes and you're creating larger distributed quantum compute nodes out of that and what comes in a distributed system that connects all of these things is the network yeah so we want to build a network that can carry quantum info and classical info on the same optical port so you don't have to build and deploy and manage two separate networks you can connect your classical islands to your quantum islands and do something together because that's what the world is going to be and on top of that we layer provably secure key exchanges because the one thing that quantum nodes do is they make all of our diffie hellman and rsa <laughs> key exchanges obsolete and that's what i wanted to yeah that, i was hoping you're going to say that yeah and because so that's the worry right that's a big worry and i think that was built on a premise that there's not going to be a quantum node exactly and if your keys are secure everything is secure but a quantum compute node can make your keys itself insecure yeah so if somebody is actually storing all of the packets today once they have access to a quantum computer all of the traffic that you've sent tls that exists yeah, out there exactly all of it is plain text so that's huge paranoia yeah especially on the federal side but eventually on the financial side as well and everybody in fact so we are actually building security where the key exchanges themselves are done through a quantum mechanism so if somebody tampers and somebody taps into it because of the quantum property there will be a state change and you will know that somebody has tampered with the key exchange so that's what we're working on any sort of like timeline or is that like you said 70 years perhaps or we know no it's actually much is much closer than that it's actually what people are thinking is something like this and don't don't like uh, hold me to it but something like this in the next 7 to 10 years will be feasible and so we need to prepare for that so yeah. we'll have to come up with something before that but right now it's in the research phase but we're working with the optical product teams to make this a reality dj you and i are not um, well maybe you are 18 but um uh, i wish i was but um i wish i was as well. exactly so talk to younger self or to the next generation what's your advice after walking this road so that that's actually a good one i mean i think uh, be open minded yep because uh, the one thing you don't want to do is silo yourself into something so try a lot of things right so i have tried a few things in my career but i wish i tried a lot more that's interesting but you got a phd in computer science i got a phd in computer, in computer science i've done i've done operational roles i've done big companies and small startups i've done a whole bunch of things i've been in distributed systems and yet I you mean, want to do more i want to do more and i think i've dabbled in so many technologies that sometimes i feel i'm just losing out <laughs> and that's a great feeling to be to be at so i would just suggest there's a comfort zone and it's just this cliche but yeah no i agree there's a comfort zone and all of us myself included we latch onto the comfort zone yep. do not latch onto the comfort zone and just try out different things especially if you are 18 yep. you have a long career ahead of you you can make mistakes and so 
I think that is the single most important thing that you can do. I love that. And don't be worried about tech. Tech is your friend. I love it. Vijay, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for it sharing. Nice to be here.